Welcome back to our little Tuesday sessions. Uh, since since last time there was a, a request for compassion meditation, I thought, well, might as well continue today and follow the sequence of the Brahma Viharas. And so uh, the next one in line would be joy. And uh, if if you don't mind, maybe I thought I would suggest uh, we try a little bit of joy tonight. <laughs> mm, too bad. <laughs> Good. We will see. Uh, we'll see how it goes for everybody. I, I'm sure it's not your first dip, anyways. So. And uh, as usual, uh, we'll begin with simply closing our eyes and taking a comfortable position and just let it all go. Relax your whole body. and smile whatever tension in your body there may be in your neck in your shoulders maybe in your cheeks maybe in your face, abdomen, simply let it all go, slowly relax into this soft awareness of your whole body. Naturally. And smile. Notice the stiffness in your body. It doesn't disappear all at once. It takes a little bit of time for the body to ease down, to slow down. So allow yourself this time and continue smiling.
and perhaps you may feel the smile on your lips but you might feel that it's not simply on your lips it actually runs through your whole body And that quite naturally, if you simply allow it to do so, it simply shines outwardly in all directions. Very simple. Fully open. Simply being happy, feeling joy, overflowing, and suffusing the entire world. You might notice that the joy is a little lighter. Not as dense as the love and the compassion. It is very simple. If you don't feel like paying too much attention to your body or form or shapes or materiality and for you this feeling is more a feeling of joy that is expansive but mentally simply allow it to.
mainly if you only were to smile and feel this smile as unlimited, universal, all around. You would be practicing mudita, as the Buddha taught it. Quite literally, this is simply being happy. Being in the ocean of joy. Here and now. Like the Buddha mentioned so often, to practice these qualities rooted in viveka, letting go, detaching, anything that would stick to the mind, rooted upon viraga calming down and niroda bringing things to their end the distractions and in this way the feeling of joy or sympathetic joy is cleansed, it becomes pure, but it also goes in the right direction. It calms down. It becomes more subtle. more sustained as we calm down, as we let go, as we bring the distractions, the mental movements 
to an end. Vosaga Parinami, which culminates in relaxing, release. If there is awareness of the body, good. If the awareness of the body slowly becomes fainter and fainter, simply let it go and stay with a more mental joy. Allowing this measureless joy to carry our awareness forward, to be the vehicle of our mindfulness. If you have a very big smile on your face, that is okay. That is very good. The mind fills up on the joy and becomes collected. This is how it stops flowing outwards to all these distractions. When it gets its fill, it will naturally calm down. We cannot force or rush or push this process. We can only sit here and 
and joy. If your mind becomes distracted a little bit, sometimes you can simply think about something that makes you happy, a wholesome thing. Perhaps it's a good action you've done in the past. Perhaps it was giving something to someone, helping someone, going through tough times. Maybe it's a person that uplifts you. Maybe it's a place in nature that makes you smile or a memory. Whatever the object may be, when the mind is uplifted and the mind can stay with the joy, simply let go of the object and follow the joy again.
And as we practice in this way, using all seven supports of awakening, of awareness, discerning of states whenever a hindrance arises and letting it go, an inspired practice which results into joy, spiritual joy, mental joy, that naturally arise from release. and reinforces mudita, the Brahma Vihara of joy. Which results in tranquility, collectedness, and steady awareness. And slowly we notice the five faculties, the panchindriyas, becoming clearer and sharper. As we relax and let go of tensions and distractions, and rest our awareness in this vehicle of joy. Bhavatu sabba mangalangra kanta sabba devata sabba buddhanu bhavena sada sati bhavantite Bhavatu sabba mangalangra kanta sabba devata sabba dhammanu bhavena sada sati bhavantite Bhavatu sabba mangalangra kanti sabba devata sabba sanghanu bhavena sada sati bhavantite May all blessings be with you and may all the devas protect you by the powers of all the buddhas, the dhamma and the sangha. May you be well and happy. Tonight, as you slowly carry your awareness towards the ear door <laughs> and incline your mind to this uh, Dhamma Desana, this discourse on the Dhamma, and tonight I will be reading the Chula Hati Padopama, the shorter simile on uh, the elephant's footprint, for lack of a shorter name. And this little story here is about. enjoying the beauty of the Buddha's teaching and not following it blindly all the way till the end. And so it makes it a very interesting uh, story and sutta. And um, 
where the Buddha himself uh, explains how to properly follow his uh, teaching and practice his teaching without falling into uh, blind belief. <laughs> and so, and in many ways, this is a wonderful uh, discourse, uh, as you will see. But this is what it is uh, based upon, mainly. And this is at Sawati at Njeto's Grove, Anatta Pindika's Park. And on that occasion, the Brahmin Janusoni was driving out of Sawati in the middle of the day in an all-white chariot drawn by white mares. He, the Brahmin Janusoni was quite famous for his white chariot. He was, there's a few suttas on it. He saw the wanderer Pilotika coming in the distance and asked him, now where is the master Vachayana coming from in the middle of the day? Sir, I am coming from the presence of the recluse Gotama. What does the master Vachayana think of the recluse Gotama's lucidity of wisdom? He is wise, is he not? Sir, who am I to not to know the recluse's Gotama's lucidity and wisdom? One, one would surely have to be his equal to know the recluse Gotama's lucidity of wisdom. Master Vachayana praises the recluse Gotama with very high praise indeed. Sir, who am I to praise the recluse Gotama? The recluse Gotama is praised by the is praised by the praised as the best amongst devas and humans. What reason does Master Vachayana see that, the, that he is such confidence in the recluse Gotama? Sir, suppose a wise elephant woodsman were to enter an elephant wood and were to see in the elephant wood a big elephant's footprint long in extent and broad across, he would come to the conclusion, indeed this is a big bull elephant. So too when I saw four footprints of the recluse Gotama, I came to the conclusion, the Blessed One is fully enlightened, the, the Dhamma is well proclaimed by the Blessed One, and the Sangha is practicing the good way. What are the four? Sir, I have seen here certain learned nobles who were clever, knowledgeable about the doctrines of others, as sharp as hair-splitting marksmen. They wander about, as it were, demolishing the views of others with their sharp wits. When they, hear, when they hear the recluse Gotama will visit such and such a village or town. They formulate a question thus. We will go to the recluse Gotama and ask him this question. If he, if he is asked like this, he will answer like this. And so we will refute his doctrine in this way. And if he is asked like that, he will answer like that. And so we will refute his doctrine in that other way. They hear, the recluse Gotama has come to visit such and such a town or a village. They go to the recluse Gotama, and the recluse Gotama instructs, urges, rouses, and gladdens them with a talk on the Dhamma. After they have been instructed and gladdened, they do not so much as ask him the question. So how should they refute his doctrine? In actual fact, they become his disciples. When I saw this first footprint of the recluse Gotama, I came to the conclusion, the Blessed One is fully enlightened, the Dhamma is well proclaimed, 
by the Blessed One, and the Sangha is practicing the good way. Again, I have seen a certain I have seen certain learned Brahmins who were clever. And he repeats this whole sequence here. For uh, the first one were the nobles, some nobles, here are some Brahmins, and some householders, and some learned recluses. So these are the four footprints that he saw who were clever, they do not so much as ask him the question, so how should they refute his doctrine? In actual fact, they ask the recluse Gautama to allow them to go forth from the home life into homelessness, and he gives them the going forth. Not long after they have gone forth, dwelling alone, withdrawn, diligent, ardent, and resolute, by realizing for themselves with direct knowledge, they here and now enter upon and abide in that supreme goal of the holy life, for the sake of which clansmen rightly go forth from the home life to homelessness. They say thus, we were nearly lost, we were nearly, we very nearly perished, for formerly we claimed that we were recluses, though we were not really recluses. We claimed that we were Brahmins, though we were not really Brahmins. We claimed that we were Arahants, though we were not really Arahants. But now we are recluses, now we are Brahmins, now we are Arahants. When I saw this fourth footprint of the recluse Gautama, I came to the conclusion the Blessed One is fully enlightened, the Dhamma is well proclaimed, and the Sangha is practicing the right way. When I saw these four footprints of the recluse Gautama, oh, repeating itself here, when this was said, the Brahmin Janusoni got down from his all-white chariot drawn by white mares and arranging his upper robe on one shoulder, he extended his hands in reverential salutations towards the Blessed One and uttered this exclamation three times, Honored to the Blessed One, accomplished and fully enlightened. Honor to the Blessed One, accomplished and fully enlightened. Honor to the Blessed One, accomplished and fully enlightened. Perhaps some time or other we might meet Master Gotama and have some conversation with him. Then the Brahmin Janusoni went to the Blessed One and exchanged greetings with him. When this courteous and amiable talk was finished, he sat down on one side and related the blessed one, to the Blessed One his entire conversation with the wanderer Pilotika. Thereupon the Blessed One told him, At this point, Brahmin, the simile of the elephant's footprint has not yet been completed in detail. As to how it is completed in detail, listen and attend closely to what I shall say. Yes, sir, the Brahmin Janusoni replied. The Blessed One said this. Brahmin, suppose an elephant woodsman were to enter an elephant wood and were to see in the elephant wood a big elephant's footprint, long in extent and broad across. A wise elephant woodsman would not yet come to the conclusion, Indeed, this is a big bull elephant. Why is that? In an elephant wood, there are small she-elephants that leave a big footprint, and this might be one of their footprints. He follows it and sees in the elephant wood a big elephant footprint long in extent and broad across, and some scrapings high up. A wise elephant woodsman would not yet come to the conclusion, indeed this is a big bull elephant. Why is that? In an elephant wood there are tall she-elephants 
that have prominent, prominent teeth and leave big footprints. And this might be one of their footprints. He follows it further and sees in the elephant wood a big elephant footprint. Long in extent and broad across and some scrapings high up and marks made by tusks. A wise elephant woodsman would not yet come to the conclusion, indeed this is a big bull elephant. Why is that? In an elephant wood there are tall she elephants that have tusks and leave a big footprint and this might be one of them, one of their footprints. He follows it further and sees in the elephant wood the big elephant footprint, long in extent and broad across, and some scrapings high up, marks made, made by tusks, and a, bro a broken off branch. And he sees that bull elephant at the root of a tree or in the open, walking about, sitting or lying down. He comes to the conclusion, this is that big bull elephant, up until he in fact sees it. So too, Brahmin, here a Tathagata appears in the world, accomplished and fully enlightened, perfect in true knowledge and conduct, sublime knower of the worlds, incomparable leader of persons to be trained, teacher of devas and humans, awakened and blessed. And this is the beginning of the talk on his whole path, which is core to his teaching, which is um, a sequence that he used in many suttas to answer people's question, but he would always change it to the person's question. He would adapt it. And now it's about this elephant footprint. He declares this world with, with its devas and maras and brahmas, this generation with its recluses and brahmins, its princes and people, which he has himself realized with direct knowledge. He teaches the Dhamma, which is good in the beginning, good in the middle, and good in the end, with the right meaning and phrasing. And he reveals a holy life that is utterly perfect and pure. A householder or householder's son, or one born in some clan or another, hears that Dhamma. On hearing the Dhamma, one acquires faith in the truth finder. Possessing that faith, he considers thus, household life his, is crowded and dusty, life gone forth is wide open. It is not easy while living at home to lead the holy life utterly perfect and pure as a polished shell. Suppose I shave off my hair and beard, put on the yellow robes, and go forth from the home life to homelessness. Usually, I would skip this little sequence here, <laughs> um, but when uh, I would talk uh, to people who are not monks, uh, and uh, here, this one slipped because I usually use my own translations. This one is not mine, but um, this also is a beautiful reminder that what you are getting uh, often here is that these are teachings that were often uh, given to monks, in fact. So this is why the context here. And the Majjhima Nikaya, the, the middle length sayings, um, was known to be uh, the collection that the Buddha uh, of the Buddha's discourses delivered to monks. And so, uh, but I would like to say that this is not at all uh, confined to monastic life at all. In fact, 
this can be interpreted simply as the meditation practice or simply anybody practicing this path and however much we align with it is however much freedom we will taste and so that is up to each and every one of us and it doesn't require going forth absolutely so this point being clarified on a later occasion abandoning a small or large fortune abandoning a small or large circle of relatives he shaves off his hair and beard puts on the yellow robe and goes forth from the home life into homelessness or just goes to some meditation retreat for 10 days Having thus gone forth and possessing the bhikkhu's training and the way of life, abandoning the killing of living beings, one abstains from killing living beings. With rod and weapon laid aside, conscientious, merciful, he abides compassionate to all living beings. Abandoning the taking of what is not given, one abstains from taking what is not given, taking only what is given, accepting only what is given. By not stealing, one abides in purity. Abandoning in celibacy, he ab one observes celibacy, living apart, abstaining from the vulgar practice of sexual intercourse. Usually also I would simply mention here uh, that it's simply um, to abstain from any kind of sexual misconduct, which is the third virtue for uh, lay people. Abandoning false speech, one abstains from false speech, one speaks the truth, adheres to the truth, is trustworthy and reliable, one who is no deceiver of the world. Abandoning malicious speech, one abstains from malicious speech, one does not repeat elsewhere what one has heard here in order to divide those people from these nor does one repeat to these people what he has heard elsewhere in order to divide those people from those. Thus one is a one who reunites those who are divided, a promoter of friendships, who enjoys concord, rejoices in concord, delights in concord. A speaker of words that are that promote concord, abandoning harsh speech, one abstains from harsh speech, one speaks such words that are gentle, pleasing to ear, and lovable, as go to the heart, are courteous, desired by many, and agreeable by many. Abandoning gossip, one abandons one abstains from gossip. One speaks at the right time, speaks what is fact, speaks on what is good, speaks on the Dhamma and the discipline. At the right time, one speaks such words that are worth recording, reasonable, moderate, and beneficial. Now it continues with the monastic uh, virtue, but I will skip through those. One becomes content with robes to protect one's body and with alms food to maintain one's stomach. And wherever one goes, one sets out taking only these things with one. Just as a bird, wherever it goes, fly with, it, with its wings as its only burden. So too monks become the the monk becomes content with robes to protect his body and with alms food to maintain one's stomach. Possessing this aggregate of noble virtue, one experiences within oneself a bliss that is blameless.
and that is very important. This is the purpose of this Aryan virtue, this noble virtue, is to be able to easily experience that blameless bliss. On seeing a form with the eye, one does not grasp at its signs and features, since if one were to leave the eye faculty unguarded, unwholesome states of grasping and dislike might invade one's mind, and one practices the way of its mastery. One guards the eye faculty. One, undertake, one undertakes the restrain, the mastery of the eye faculty. On hearing a sound with the ear, on smelling an odor with the nose, on tasting a flavor with the tongue, on touching a tangible with the body, on cognizing a mind object with the mind, one does not grasp at its signs and features. Since if one left the mind faculty unguarded, unwholesome states of grasping and dislike might invade one's mind. One practices the way of its mastery and one guards the mind faculty. One, under, one undertakes the mastery of the mind faculty. Possessing this noble mastery of the faculties, one experiences within oneself a bliss that is unsullied. And so we are slowly practicing ourselves to um, prepare the ground for meditation. And as I often mention, this is not only a meditation practice, this is all the time, all the time practice. And whenever there is a distraction arising in the mind, it arises at any one of these sense doors or from anyone, any of these senses. And therefore, this is where we use this awareness that we're developing. This is where we are directing it when we see that we are starting to grasp at something and take something very seriously and build up tension around it, whether it's I like or I don't like or I want or I don't want, that, that judgment. Then we are moving away from being able to experience that bliss that is unsullied where we start things start to stick to the mind and this is how we also maintain and protect what we have cultivated in our meditation practice therefore this is the active meditation at this point it is the meditation in all aspects of life and so we can remain with that joy that we've cultivated earlier so that it remains protected. One becomes one who acts in full awareness when going forward and returning, who acts in full awareness when looking ahead and looking away, who acts in full awareness when flexing and extending one's limbs who acts in full awareness when wearing one's robe and carrying one's outer robe and bowl, who acts in full awareness when eating, drinking, consuming food and tasting, who acts in full awareness when defecating and urinating, who acts in full awareness when walking, standing, sitting, falling asleep, waking up, talking and keeping silent. And so this full awareness is simply what happens when we let go of any distractions at the six sense doors, even the mind. What results from this is naturally awareness. And so we are, it's not really that we are directing our awareness to walking or putting on the robe. It simply happens because 
the mind isn't grasping at an idea or who are we going to go see this afternoon or what you want to do tomorrow or what happened with this person yesterday the mind lets go of this and is able to remain in this presence in this full awareness possessing this aggregate of noble virtue and this noble mastery of the faculties possessing this noble mindfulness and full awareness one resorts to a secluded resting place to the forest the root of a tree a mountain a ravine a hillside cave a charnel ground a jungle thicket an open space a heap of straw on returning from alms round after one's meal one sits down folding one's legs crosswise setting one's body erect and establishing mindfulness before oneself abandoning covetousness for the world one abides with a mind free from covetousness and one purifies one's mind from covetousness this is simply latching on all these things externally so we can finally be free in mind Abandoning ill will and hatred, another big hindrance. He abides with a mind free from ill will, compassionate for the welfare of all living beings. One purifies one's mind from ill will and hatred. Abandoning sloth and torpor, one abides free from sloth and torpor. Seeing clearly, mindful and fully aware, one purifies one's mind of sloth and torpor. Abandoning restlessness and remorse, one abides unagitated. With a mind inwardly peaceful, one purifies one's mind from restlessness and remorse. Abandoning doubt, one, aband one abides having gone beyond doubt, unperplexed about wholesome states, one purifies one's mind from doubt and see how interesting it is here doubt in the buddha's teaching is about the teaching not whether uh, you're gonna eat cereals or toast in the morning it's about what state are wholesome or why are these states wholesome and why are these other states unwholesome because love care compassion forgiveness joy they are states that are aware in themselves they are states that are caring that and carry this awareness whereas wanting all kinds of things outside um, dislike uh, resentment and uh, jealousy for example are states that are reactive they are these emotional upsets that happen when mindfulness slips these states arise and we um, we lose mindfulness and having doubt or doubt as a hindrance is not knowing these things which is closely related to discernment and so we learn to sharpen this and to get to hear the Dhamma and this is how we overcome doubt also and by practice and the Buddha did not mention only one uh, meditation technique to overcome these hindrances he said to cut through thought uh, using the breath as a reminder was a wonderful technique he said for overcoming ill will or resentment and develop compassion loving kindness and compassion are great to overcome uh, discontent joy is a great practice um, and to uh, overcome
grasping or attachment to certain things, we can contemplate what is unattractive within them. Therefore, we completely break any kind of um, mental limitations that we could have for our meditation practice and happiness in our lives. Having thus abandoned these five hindrances, imperfections of the mind that weaken wisdom, quite secluded from sensual pleasures, secluded from unwholesome states, one enters upon and abides in the first jhana, which is accompanied by applied and sustained thought with bliss and pleasure born of seclusion. I usually say that this is born of letting go, letting go of the tension, calming down, relaxing. There is this natural joy, this natural viveka jang piti sukkang, this blissful happiness born of letting go. And at this point there is still thinking and examining or reflection, vitaka and vichara. Uh, which is an object, an uplifting object that we can bring up and use to uplift the mind. And um, develop the faculties that we need for beginning this meditation. And so abandoning the hindrances in the first jhana, there is not a clear break in between them. It is all part of the same process, but it gradually moves into the first level of meditation. As these qualities get stronger, more defined, and uh, more established. This Brahmin is called a footprint of the truth finder, something scraped by the Tathagata, something marked by the Tathagata. The Tathagata is the truth finder, the Buddha. He often talked about himself in the third person, so using that epitaph. But a noble disciple does not yet come to the conclusion the Blessed One is fully awakened, the Dhamma is well proclaimed by the Blessed One, and the Sangha is practicing the good way. Again, with the stilling of applied and sustained thought, thinking and reflection, a monk or a person enters upon and abides in the second jhana, which has inner tranquility and singleness of mind, without applied and without thinking nor reflection, with the joy and happiness born of collectedness. And see, as we practice in the proper way, using right effort, letting go of tension and unwholesome states and bringing up states that are wholesome, whether it's the loving kindness, the compassion, the joy, the mind will, it slowly detaches and it fills up on that joy and it does not flow outside anymore, therefore it starts to pool. The water of awareness stops flowing outwardly and it starts to pool in the mind. And this is called samadhi, collectedness. And at this point in the second level of meditation, this becomes much more prominent and this becomes more clear as we practice. And the joy that comes from this is uh, notable. This too, Brahman, is called a footprint of the Tathagata, something scraped by the Tathagata, something marked by the Tathagata. But a noble disciple does not yet come to the conclusion the Blessed One is fully awakened, the Dhamma is well proclaimed, the Sangha is practicing the good way. Again, with the fading away of excited joy, 
A person abides in equanimity and mindful and fully aware, still feeling pleasure with the body. One enters upon and abides in the third jhana, on account of which noble ones announce he has a pleasant one has a pleasant abiding who has equanimity and is mindful. This too Brahman is called a footprint of the Tathagata, but a, something scraped by the Tathagata, something marked by the Tathagata, but a noble disciple does not yet come to the conclusion. The Blessed One is fully awakened, the Dhamma is well proclaimed, and the Sangha is practicing the good way. Again, with the, the abandoning of pleasure and pain, and with the previous disappearance of joy and grief, a person enters and abides in the fourth level of meditation, which has neither pain nor pleasure and purity of mindfulness, due to equanimity. This too, Brahman, is called a footprint of the Tathagata, something marked by the Tathagata, something scraped by the Tathagata. But a noble disciple does not yet come to the conclusion, the Blessed One is fully awakened, the Dhamma is well proclaimed, and the Sangha is practicing the good way. When one's mind is collected, is thus purified, bright, unblemished, rid of imperfection, malleable, wieldy, steady, and attained to imperturbability, one directs it to the knowledge of the recollection of past lives. One recollects one's manifold past lives, that is, one birth, two births, three births, four births, five births, ten births, twenty births, thirty births, forty, fifty, a hundred births, a thousand births, a hundred thousand births, many eons of world contraction, many eons of world expansion, many eons of world contraction and expansion. One recollects their past lives, thus with their aspects and particular particulars, one recollects one's manifold past lives. This too Brahman is called the footprint of the Tathagata. Something scraped, something marked by the Tathagata. But a noble disciple does not yet come to the conclusion the Blessed One is fully awakened. When one's mind is collected and thus purified, bright, unblemished, rid of imperfection, malleable, wieldy, steady, and attained to imperturbability, one directs it to the knowledge of passing away and reappearance of beings. With the divine eye, which is purified and surpasses the human, one sees beings passing away and reappearing, inferior and superior, fortunate and unfortunate. One understands how beings pass on according to their actions. Thus with the divine eye which is purified and surpasses the human, one sees beings passing away and reappearing, inferior and superior and passing according to their action. This too, Brahman, is, a, is called a footprint of the Tathagata. But, no, but a noble disciple does not yet come to the conclusion, the Blessed One is fully awakened, the Dhamma is well proclaimed, and the Sangha is practicing the good way. When one's collected mind is thus purified, bright, unblemished, rid of imperfection, malleable, wieldy, steady, and attained to imperturbability, one directs it to the knowledge of the stilling of the distractions. 
one understands as it actually is this is tension this is the origin of tension this is the cessation of tension this is the way leading to the cessation of tension constantly using this pattern to purify the mind to the deepest levels these are the distractions the this is the origin of the distractions this is the cessation of the distractions this is the way leading to the cessation of the distractions this too brahman is called the footprint of the tathagata something scraped by the tathagata something marked by the tathagata but a noble disciple still has not come to the conclusion the blessed one is fully awakened the dhamma is well proclaimed and the sangha is practicing the good way rather he is or one is in the process of coming to this conclusion so see the even the buddha made it fairly clear not to grasp at any part of the teaching blindly and to practice in a way that we grow understanding slowly and the more we practice the more we get to see that what the buddha was saying was true through our own direct experience but all of this gets completely confirmed at the very end also when one knows and sees thus one's mind is liberated from the distraction of sensual desire from the distraction of becoming and from the distraction of carelessness when it is liberated there comes the knowledge it is liberated one understands unwholesome states or birth is destroyed the holy life has been lived and what had to be done has has been done there is no more coming to any state of conceit this stu brahman is called a footprint of the tathagata something scraped by the tathagata something marked by the tathagata it is at this point that a noble disciple has come to the conclusion the blessed one is fully awakened the dhamma is well proclaimed by the blessed one the sangha is practicing the good way and it is at this point brahman that the simile of the elephant's footprint has been completed in detail when this was said the brahman janasoni said to the blessed one magnificent master gotama magnificent Master Gotama has made the dhamma clear in many ways as though he were turning upright what had been overthrown revealing what was hidden showing the way to one who was lost or holding up a lamp in the dark for those with eyesight to see what was there I go to Master Gotama for refuge and to the dhamma and to the bhikkhu sangha from today let Master Gotama remember me as a lay follower who has gone for refuge to him for life and this is how this wonderful little story here ends and i thought i would uh, offer this as a um as a beautiful exposition of his path through that little story of the footprint and the markings and that uh sometimes we might uh be quick on uh taking certain things for granted and um maybe going fast in the, in the in going to places uh where faith becomes or uh, our understanding uh faith goes beyond 
uh, understanding or wisdom. And in the Buddha's teaching, these two always remain very uh, balanced. Wisdom, faith balanced by wisdom. And wisdom also is, though we must say that wisdom is driven forward by faith. Uh, so that is how this process happens. But... Um, And to always have in the back of our minds, to always uh, remember to, uh, to reflect back on our experience, on our direct experience, and to see and to reflect on what we've lived and w how does it reflect to the teachings and the suttas. And to read, to learn the suttas, to listen to the Dhamma, to uh, know and make sure we're uh, practicing the right way and to keep us in truth. And this is always uh, there to help us, this uh, reflection. Uh, the Buddha said it's Pachawekana this reflective view on our practice and how we see and understand the Dhamma. And so, I will leave it open for questions if there are some. <laughs> Oh, yes. I, I would like to say thank you. Yes. Oh, good. My pleasure. Thank you for sharing. Sadhu, sadhu. Good. This is my first time I've got to come to one of the Dharma Talks. Oh. And, uh, and Terry and Ben and especially Johnny to um, say thanks for making the connection. I really appreciate it. I, I've been a Goenkaji meditator for a number of years and some um, Christian transcendental before that. So I'm really grateful to get the smile and perspective. Good, good, good. You have good friends. <laughs> good. Well, welcome to this first time on here. So it's good, good to meet you. <laughs> good. My name's Ana Lisa. Um, I didn't catch that. My name is Annalisa. Nice to meet Annalisa, you. Annalisa, okay, yes. Anna, Annalisa, nice to meet you, yes. <laughs> Good. Wonderful. Okay. Maybe I'll leave a, a few seconds. Sometimes, uh, sometimes there's some hesitation, people. It takes a little bit of time. <laughs> okay. Okay. Well, let's share our merits and then I will let you go. May suffering ones be suffering free and the fear struck fearless be. May the grieving shed all grief and may all beings find relief. May all beings share this merit that we have thus acquired for the acquisition of all kinds of happiness. May beings inhabiting space and earth, devas and nagas of mighty powers, share this merit of ours. May they long protect the Buddha's dispensation. Sadi, sadi.